Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brandon here. Welcome to another Waypoint Student Ministry message. We are in Acts chapter 8. This is a long one, verses 1 through 40. That's how many verses are in Acts 8. So before we begin, we'll pray, and I'm actually going to paraphrase the sections in this chapter because a lot goes down. As I said before, I recommend again, take the time to read this on your own, read in different translations, or just have the audio Bible up just so that you can gain some more insight on your own and have your own time with God. All right, let's do this. Father God, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to preach, to minister, to be used by you, God, to help inspire others and encourage others, to be used by you, Lord, to tell others about your good news and that you love them, that you care for them, God, that you have a plan for them a plan that we don't understand, but it's a plan nonetheless, and it's a plan that is not to harm us. It's for us to prosper. So, Lord, we love you and thank you. Help us to stay focused and receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's do this. So, previously in Acts 7, we read about Stephen the martyr, one of the seven deacons, one of the seven leaders that were chosen, and this man was stoned by a lot of other people by by Jews and people alike who just didn't like Stephen like what he's preaching they didn't like what he was about and it talks about how everyone dropped their coats off by Saul and in Acts 8 it continues that saying and Saul approved of the killing so it wasn't just some random name drop of a character Saul significant in this story so what ends up happening is that Saul ends up leading this great persecution to the Christians, towards the Christians. They're literally going into people's houses because the Christians met at houses. They went into the houses and started pulling people out and, you know, stoning them and persecuting them. And it's just, it was a lot, not just verbal abuse, but physical abuse. A lot of disturbing actions were being done against the Christians. And since they got so many people behind it, it was kind of, impossible to stop the persecution from going off from from occurring uh everyone's scattered around but they still despite them being scattered despite the assault they still preached they still met and talked about jesus and the good news they still did church so that is crazy that despite what happened they didn't give up they did not lose hope that reminds me of a pastor friend that i know this lady is an awesome woman of god and when she was actually in prison, that's where she met God, met Jesus, and developed a relationship with him. And she was doing a Bible study, and she would get jumped for doing Bible studies. And that says a lot. Like, despite what happened, she still kept on meeting with people, talking about the Bible, talking about Jesus, learning more about God, despite what was being done, despite her life being on the line and and god honored her faithfulness years later she's married she has a family she's doing well god has restored her greatly so it makes you think it gets you thinking are you that bold for the faith are you that committed to being a christian to sharing the love of christ despite what others may say about you may think about you may do to you you know if there's a gun pointed to your head and someone asks you are you a christian what would your response be and Luckily, thank God, in America, we don't have to deal with such extremes like that. But there's people around the world who deal with that and worse. And these people are just sold out. And it just gets you thinking, why aren't we sold out? You know, what what is it that, why don't we have that zeal like these other Christians around the world? Or even like the Christians in the New Testament, in the early church. The next story we're going to read about in Acts 8 is about a man named Philip. And it wasn't the disciple Philip. It was one of the seven, just like Stephen. And this man, he went to a city in Samaria, and he did the same thing, proclaimed the Messiah, talked about Jesus, talked about the good news. He did miracles, and, you know, demons were being casted out as he was preaching, as he was ministering. And as you went about this, right, it takes a second to kind of tell you about another character that Philip and the other disciples are going to interact with. And this man's name is Simon. And no, not Simon Peter. They actually call him Simon the Magus, Simon the Sorcerer. This guy used demonic power. And yes, we're reading the Bible. Reading this, it kind of sounds like a little bit like a fantasy story. But this is real. This is legit stuff. This man named Simon, right, he practiced sorcery. He went ahead and used this power he had to do crazy feats and miracles. And it wasn't just a sleight of hand kind of 
uh, tricks. He wasn't doing some fancy little illusions. He was doing some real things, and people were just like, wow, like this dude is crazy. This dude's powerful. So he got a title. He started being called the Great Power of God. That was his showman name. That's who he was doing his thing. And as time went on, he ended up hearing about Philip. And Philip, again, doing what he does, preaching, talking about Jesus, talking about the good news, the kingdom of God. And Simon (laughs) apparently got saved. He was moved by this. He was amazed by this. And he ended up getting baptized, etc., etc. And that's when Peter and John come because they heard about what was going on in Samaria. And they came down to help the people who just got saved, the new converts, experience the Holy Spirit. So they kind of have like a little revival service. They got some stuff going on. And when Peter and John came to allow the Holy Spirit to come and make his way through and for the people to be baptized by fire because they'd just been baptized by water. Simon was astonished by this as well. And he went ahead and was wondering like, yo, like, what do I need to do? What do I need to pay to get this kind of power, this ability? (laughs) Peter was not happy with that response. He did not like that. If you read previously, if you if you read with us, if you were listening uh, a while back in one of the chapters in Acts, it talks about this couple and how they also try to use money to get some type of position and title and whatever, you know, status in the church and the tensions were wrong and they ended up dying. It's some crazy stuff that ended up dying and so... I wonder what Peter was thinking. Peter was probably thinking, like, yo, this is about to get smite down right in front of my face, too. Someone else is going to come and pick him up and take him away. So Peter says, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. So he continues on saying this man's heart was filled with bitterness and he's a captive to sin. Simon's freaking out. He's like, yo, please pray that that this, what you said, doesn't happen to me. And it doesn't really say what happens to him next, to be honest. I'm really curious on what happens to Simon and what the next event goes down. But apparently Luke didn't think it was important enough to jot that down because the next section, the next story is about Philip again ministering. But I don't want to just rush to this next part. I want to take a second, have us digest what we've been reading, what we've been paraphrasing and going over. So Philip, Philip went to Samaria and there that Jews, Samaritans, they don't mix. They don't get together. And it's because Samaritans, they're seen as half breeds, half Jew, half Gentile. It's just there's a lot of discrimination that's there, that's present against the Samaritans. That's why it was such a big deal when uh, Jesus talks about the story of the Good Samaritan because they're like, whoa, 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 we don't associate with these people. We don't deal with these people. And it's insane that even back then, people who believe in the word, believe in the goodness of God, still had trouble showing the goodness to other people. Reading this story just shows that history repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun. Discrimination has always been a thing, an issue. There's still going to be Christians who are going to try to pay their way to some type of status and power and ability and uh, whatever. You know, there's still people who are going to, despite them going to church, be racist. Unfortunately, there's still going to be people who go to church and just do very ungodly Christ-like things. And it's it's insane. I've told people, and I'll say it again, that the devil goes to church. And that's why you got to guard your heart and know yourself and make sure you're not playing games when you're going to church. You're not playing games and getting yourself together, getting your life together, and genuinely pursue God, pursue Jesus, pursue a relationship, get to know him, and stay up to date doing your spiritual disciplines and just repent. Repent of your ways. Repent of the stupidity that you tend to do, that I tend to do. I have to repent on a regular basis, you know. It happens. We're human, and and God understands that, but he sees your heart, so you're not fooling anybody, you know. You're not, you may be fooling people, but you're not, definitely not fooling God. Another thing is that it's insane because how is it that in the early church, when people went, when the ministers went to locations, right, leaders filled with spirit and wisdom, because that was the criteria for the leaders mentioned uh, of the of the deacons and all that stuff, and Stephen was man filled with spirit and wisdom, and Philip was one too. 
how these individuals went to places talking about the good news of God. That's all they did. They just told people about Jesus, that same story over and over again, and miracles started happening. Demons started being casted out. What, what What's the difference with that and today, then and now? Why? Like, what's going on? And that's a really great character check for churches. You know, what's are there testimonies that are happening, but no one's testifying. No one's talking about the miracles and the great things that God is doing in their personal lives. Are we gotten so private where we we're on we're ashamed that we had an issue and that God did great in solving the issue? It was like, okay, well, if I have to praise God out loud or tell people about what Jesus did, I have to acknowledge that this was a problem in the first place. And, and that's insane, and, and it makes sense why we can feel so shameful, especially with everybody having an opinion, everybody making a comment, and just, it's just, it's insane. We can be very toxic at times, but still, like, man, God is so good, and if you go and you tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ, you will experience, you will witness miracles happening, spiritual, emotional, and even physical miracles. The final section of this chapter is called Philip and the Ethiopian. And so God, or an angel of the Lord, came to Philip and told him, hey, go down this road. I want you to go here. God said, let's go to walk here. Okay. And along that path, he saw in a chariot, this Ethiopian treasurer kind of guy, Eunuk. I can't pronounce that, sorry. He's basically an official uh, charge of all the treasury for the Kandake, which basically means queen of the Ethiopians. And so this guy go, went to Jerusalem to worship, and he's chilling on his chariot, passing. He's trying to read Isaiah, one of the books of the Bible, right? One of the prophetic books. Philip kind of just runs up to the chariot because God just leads him to it. God told him to do so, and he says... Hey, so what you're reading there? Do you understand what you're reading? And the guy's super perplexed, confused. Is like, I have no idea. How how can I know if unless someone tells me? And Philip goes, and they have this dialogue about it. But let's digest this scene. I know I've had moments where God has told me to pray for someone or to talk to someone, and it's funny because it'll be as we're passing each other. So I keep debating is this god telling me what's this urge should i do it this is weird i feel uncomfortable and once i'm like good 15 feet away from the person i'm like ah okay and i turn around i run back awkwardly running now not trying to run too fast because you just scare them but not too slow you know that you're trying to look awkward trying to get to this person and saying hey i don't know you but i feel like god wants you to pray for you or i say whatever god needs me to say and I believe that happened with Philip, that God was urging him to interact with this man, to, to talk to him about Jesus. And it was really cool because I can just see the man inviting Philip into the chariot. They're talking about the word of God, talking about how Isaiah's prophecies were talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah has come and he's he rose from the dead and all this stuff. And this man was astonished and just impacted. He had a come to Jesus moment and he ended up becoming baptized. And it was such a cool experience and that's what God wants to do with us he wants to use us to come after the ones he loves and cares about random people or to you it seems like random people but to God they're chosen people all around us to say hey you matter hey let me tell you a story about Jesus and through that gospel through the story of Jesus right Evangelion these people become saved they now get to experience the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of the Lord, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, all that stuff. And there's now a shift that happens, and they are now able to enter the kingdom of heaven. I really enjoyed reading Acts 8. It's different from the other Acts chapters, uh, just reading about Philip and the little different stories of Philip's interactions. It's really cool. Just to, and, and Philip's not one you really hear preached about in church for some reason, which I don't know why, but there should be more sermons on Philip. And if you really enjoyed this message, if you enjoyed learning about Philip and what was going on, share it with other people. Say, hey, I listened to this episode uh, or podcast sermon message early today, a very short one. And there's this guy in the Bible and how this guy was just using him to do these things. And just the story that went on, like, yo, there's an actual sorcerer that's mentioned in the Bible. Like, yeah, yeah like Lord of the Rings type stuff, <laughs> you know, and who knows how that interaction may go, what that conversation may lead to. But I just want to let you guys know you matter. I believe in you. God believes in you. I'm praying for every single one of you guys. I know things can be tough 
keep moving forward, keep your head up high. And with that being said, I hope you all have a wonderful and blessed day. God bless. God bless.